Hello everyone, uh, my name is Lacey Quayle and I am an Extension Livestock Management Specialist with North Dakota State University and I am based out of the North Central Research Extension Center in Minot, uh, North Dakota. So as part of this backgrounding series, um, it was important to focus a little bit on preparing heifers from weaning to their first breeding season and how we can best prepare them uh, to become successful members of our cow herds. So in the overall beef production timeline, typically calves are weaned sometime from six to eight months of age. Of course, for our spring calving herds, that's going to be sometime in the fall. Uh, and in this scenario, the steer calves are uh, entering a backgrounding phase after weaning before they enter a finishing phase in a feedlot before entering the beef supply chain. While they can also enter the beef supply, when we think about heifer calves, um, they may be retained by a cow-calf operation as replacement females. So after weaning, they enter a phase known as heifer development. Um, and then during this phase, it's important that we consider what types of management considerations will best set that heifer up to be a successful member of the cow herd um, before entering her first breeding season. So that leads us into the question of really what is it that makes a good heifer? How do we know which heifer calves will make good replacement females? And I think the easiest, uh, most straightforward answer to that question is that the heifers that we want to keep um, are those that will make good cows, right? And so we know that um, when it comes to to keeping good cows, um, reproduction is five times more valuable um, than any calf growth metric, right? And that's largely due to the fact that we want cows to stick around for a long time. So we want cows with longevity that continually produce healthy live calves for us. So in other, in other words, a good cow really boils down to having live calves and um, being in our herds for a long period of time. So longevity is such a key component uh, in the cow-calf operation because of cow depreciation costs. And that's directly related to the number of years that she spent um, being a productive member of the herd. And so in this equation here, uh, we take a replacement cost and we subtract out what that salvage value might be on a female. And we divide it by the number of productive years that she has spent in the herd. So as we increase the number of years that a cow is in the herd, her depreciation cost on a yearly basis um, actually decreases. So all that to say, if we want our cows to have live calves in a timely manner and stick around for a number of years, it's safe to say that we should want our heifer calves um, to be prepared to do that same thing, right? And so we should be preparing our replacement heifers to carry out those same responsibilities uh, in their future. So before we can prepare any replacement females, we need to be able to identify them from, from all of the heifer calves that we have. Uh, so we'd like, I'd like to take a few minutes uh, here to begin with to go through some of the important selection criteria when it comes to sorting off heifers that um, you, you might like to keep around. And I think it's safe to say that history repeats itself, and that's true um, in our day-to-day -day lives, uh, but it's also true in cattle production. And so when we're selecting replacement heifers, I, I think it's important that we consider the cow uh, that she came from, right? Really analyzing um, if that, that cow has ever struggled with dystocia before or if she's consistently calved late um, in the calving season, meaning that she consistently is rebreeding late in the breeding season. Um, has she ever failed to wean a calf? Uh, and then next, really looking uh, at her, her teats and her udder conformation. Um, maybe her calves have struggled to nurse before, and that's something to definitely take note of. Or maybe she's consistently weaned light calves at weaning time. And then lastly, um, rounding out, you know, just considering any, any attitude problems that, that she might have compared to the rest of the herd. And so while all the answers to, to those questions uh, will vary from herd to herd or from operation to operation, there's been a considerable amount of research that's been done on uh, heifer performance. And with that research, we've been able to come up with our non-negotiables for, 
um, selecting replacement heifers and really the, the types of things we should be looking for in those replacements. So we wanna keep heifers that are born in the first 21 days of the calving season. And ideally we'd like to keep heifers that are born um, from older cows. Um, that really just shows that those cows have proven their ability to um, have an increased longevity and have, have proven themselves in the herd. Um, there's also some data that shows that heifer calves from um, cows that are six years of age or older um, actually have an increase in fertility as well. And then lastly, just to, to round it out, it's important to consider um, any specific phenotype that you'd like to match um, to your herd, right? So any replacement heifers should fit that desired phenotype when it comes to conformation or udder structure or if pedigree is something that um, you're focused on. Now I mentioned keeping replacement heifers that were born in the first 21 days of the calving season. And that statement really comes from some research out of Nebraska that looked at how weaning and pre-breeding weights compared between heifers that were born in the first, second, and third 21 day periods of the calving season. So from day one to day 21, day tw uh, 22 to 42, and from day uh, 43 uh, to 63. And so what you'll notice here is that, um, so, so these periods, 21 day periods represent when their dams got um, pregnant during the breeding season, right, when they conceived. And so you'll notice here that heifer calves that are born early in the calving season have greater weaning weights, but they also have uh, greater pre-breeding weights, right? So they're consistently, those early born heifers are heavier at weaning and before breeding compared to heifer calves that are born later. And this spread is anywhere from about 50, 50 pounds or so. So if we follow those same heifer calves out to their first breeding season, we'll notice a similar trend here. And that heifers that are born early, um, again, those in the green bars here, those are heifers that are born in the first 21 days of the calving season, you'll notice that they are more likely to be cycling prior to their first breeding season. And so 70% of early born heifers cycle before their first breeding season starts, whereas just short of 40%, of late born heifer calves are going to be cycling prior to the breeding season. And that's really important as we think about pregnancy rates. Um, you know, a heifer needs to start cycling prior um, to being able to be capable of becoming pregnant. Um, so looking at pregnancy rates here, you'll notice that those early born heifers uh, actually have greater pregnancy rates in their first calving season, or excuse me, in their first breeding season compared to heifers that uh, were born later in the calving season. And so maybe what's even more important to, to mention here is that those heifer calves that were born in the first 21 days, these here in the green bar, they themselves are actually calving earlier uh, in their first calving season. And so we're really just creating a snowball effect um, and the cycle continues so that early born heifers uh, become early calving cows. And you'll notice here, 81% um, of early born heifers calve in the first 21 days of their first calving season. Now, the reason I chose to highlight that fact is that heifers that calve early in their first calving season, um, they stay in the herd for a longer period of time. And if you remember back to a few slides ago, um, longevity was one of the most important things when we considered profitability of the cow-calf operation. And so heifers are expensive to develop, and we'll talk about that throughout this operate or throughout this presentation. Um, so it's important to remember that. Re remaining in the herd for a long period of time um, and being a productive member of the herd for a long period of time is, is going to improve our, our profitability. And so this data out of Nebraska um, continued from the last, the last slides that I showed, the same study. It shows that heifers that calve early in their first calving season, they're actually staying in the herd for a longer period of time compared to heifers that um, calve later in their first calving season. 
So on the solid line here, we have heifers that calve in the first 21 days of their first calving season. And there's actually more of those heifers around um, at year five and out to year nine compared to heifers that calve um, after day 22 of their first calving season. And not only are those heifers staying around longer, but they're also producing calves with greater weaning weights compared to heifers that um, are calving later in their first calving season. So here we have early calving heifers in the black bars, and um, you'll notice here a difference in increased weaning weight for the first six calves, the first six years um, that they're in the herd. And what's interesting is that if you add up the difference between the black bars and the gray bars, that added difference for six years actually adds up to nearly um, a seventh, the weaning weight of a seventh calf. And so that's a huge consideration when we think about the profitability of a female in our cow herds and, and how productive that she's being. So to kind of summarize all of this uh, on replacement selection, it's important to think about how um, retaining heifers that were born in the first 21 days of the calving season, right? It's important to think about that because not only are they more likely to attain puberty prior to their, their first breeding season, but they have greater pregnancy rates uh, in that season, and they're also more likely to calve early themselves, uh, continuing that cycle, as I mentioned. And we just mentioned how, um, how longevity uh, was also linked to that as well, right? And how important that was uh, to longevity and, and productivity when we think about performance of, of her calves. All of those points are directly related to having more not like more live calves and having greater longevity, which you, if you remember, um, are two very key points when it comes to thinking about profitability of our cow herds. So we've got a decent handle now on on how to select um, for replacement females, right? And we now going forward, we should probably um, have an idea of how we're going to develop them from weaning to breeding uh, to set them up for success. So now what? We've got our set of heifers that we've selected these uh, these few out of our whole group. Um, and now, now what expectations do we have of those that we've selected? Well, I think it's safe to say that most operations probably have pretty similar goals for their replacement heifers, um, regardless maybe of what breed they raise or where they might be located. Um, and we have some pretty rigorous go goals for our replacement heifers, right? We first want them to attain puberty prior to their first breeding season um, so that they can become pregnant around 14 to 15 months of age. That sets them up really well to calve by two years of age, and we'd really like it if they could calve unassisted, right? We then expect them to raise and wean a marketable calf, uh, and then rebreed in a timely manner so that they can maintain a yearly calving interval. So all of those are pieces to the puzzle that lead to maximum productivity in a replacement heifer. And, and knowing that, I think it's really important to, to mention that there's no set right or wrong way to go about heifer development. But these are some goals that we really need to consider when we think about profitability of an operation and how your replacement heifers fit into that and contribute to that. So in this way, we need to think about heifer development like a stalker operation or backgrounding operation um, because meeting our break even with heifers as they become part of the cow herd is a, is a really critical time point. So the first goal we had for our heifers was that they attain puberty. And we know that puberty is a very complex process that involves the brain and the ovary working together. Um, and it's influenced by several different factors, which is part of the reason why it's so hard to understand. But um, we know that it's influenced by genetics and in the age of puberty is actually moderately heritable. Um, it's also influenced by age, you know, just as heifers get older, um, they get closer to puberty and it's influenced a lot um, by nutrition that that heifer is exposed to. So nutrition and age work together um, and as age and body weight both increase, um, 
heifers will, will work their way towards puberty, right? And of course, there are a million and one ways that we can go about from moving from a weaned heifer calf um, to a pubertal heifer. And we'll talk about some of those strategies that utilize different, different patterns of weight gain. It's important for me to mention that um, as we think about different patterns of, of weight gain in this, this time period and re reaching towards puberty in, in heifers that uh, the research would suggest that while overall nutrition is definitely important for a heifer to reach puberty, um, we can have a pretty significant impact on programming the timing of puberty with pre-weaning nutrition um, because there are really important developmental time points that happen later on in life, or excuse me, that, that happen early in, in a heifer's life. But more recently, genetic selection for age at puberty has changed how nutrition and um, is interacting with puberty. And so that's shifted a little bit. And if you're not necessarily struggling with timely puberty attainment in your, in your heifers, some of the more intensive pre-weaning nutritional strategies um, are likely not something that you, you need to be focusing on. So for those reasons, um, today I'd really like to focus on what nutritional strategies we can use after weaning to, to set our replacement heifers up to be uh, successful long-term members of our cow herd. So that leads me to, to introduce the two systems that are typically thought about for heifer development. Um, on the top half of the slide here, we have what most of you would probably consider the traditional system um, and the traditional approach where heifers are kept and fed in a dry lot system and they gain weight at a moderate to moderately high rate of gain. I think it's um, also safe to say that feed costs have increased in the last few decades, and that's led to research and some critical thinking on some more alternative um, strategies that utilize more extensive grazing, um, shown down here, uh, when we think about using crop residue or dormant range to potentially reduce heifer development costs. And so it's really important to recognize here that, again, there is no right or wrong system, um, but comparing each system to what fits your environment uh, is, is best, right? And we have a variety of types of cattle operations across North Dakota and across the country. Um, and so our def there are definitely regions where each of the, these systems um, could fit in very well. So traditionally, uh, the thought was for decades that um, to, to, or that was to develop heifers to 60 to 65 percent of their mature body weight. And this was based off of research that was done from the 1960s to 1990s. Um, and, and during that time period, there was really a lot of pretty drastic changes in the cattle industry. Right. And we worked from cows uh, or excuse me, heifers having their first calf at three years old to heifers having their first calf at two years old. And so that put a lot of pressure on the age at puberty. And so to mitigate that, um, the, the 60 to 65 percent of mature weight at first breeding um, was used to help mitigate that, that challenge. And so this approach also focused on maximizing the number of heifers that got pregnant in their first breeding season, which is, is not a bad thing. Um, but we know that there are environments in North Dakota and environments across the country that might be harder for heifers to um, reach that 60 to 65 percent of their mature weight prior to their first breeding season. And so some more recent research um, actually has shown that the majority of heifers um, obtain puberty at 55 to 60 percent of their mature body weight. And there have been several studies that have evaluated whether or not heifers can be developed to a lighter weight without um, sacrificing any reproductive performance as a way to try and decrease developmental costs. And so to compare these two systems, I'd really like to talk about a study that um, utilized both systems in, in Nebraska. And the goal of this was to compare heifers that were developed in these two systems, right? In a typical dry lot setting um, or grazing uh, corn residue or also native range. And so uh, in this study, they, they did this for three years and heifers were all at a similar body weight to begin the study. And they, at the end of the developmental period, they were synchronized with progesterone and either time AI'd 
and inseminated, um, or they were inseminated off of estrus uh, before being turned in with bulls uh, for a 60-day breeding season. So after weaning the heifers, uh, they entered either the dry lot setting from anywhere from 150 to 208 days, uh, depending on the year, or heifers were developed on corn residue or native range if needed due to uh, snowfall for 91 to 135 days, um, depending on the year. So the grazing heifers, they were also spent time in the dry lot for the last 47 to 79 days, again, depending on the year, um, and that was just prior to the breeding season. So they all spent time in a dry lot. It was just um, whether the majority of the time was spent on range uh, and corn residue or spent in a dry lot. And before we get into the specifics on the growth rates and, and reproductive performance and some of the results of this study, I, I think it's important to mention that by the end of the developmental period, um, these dry lot heifers had reached 65% of their mature body weight, um, whereas the heifers that spent time on corn residue and, and winter range had reached 56% of their mature body weight. So I don't think it will come as a surprise, um, maybe to any of you, that grazing heifers were about 115 pounds lighter. You'll notice here in the in the first bar, 115 pounds lighter um, after the winter, so after that that winter developmental period, or going into their first breeding season. What I do think is important to mention is that by the time they reached um, their first calving season, both dry lot and grazing heifers were similar in weight to one another. And so if we look at the big picture and start to look at the pattern, or, or excuse me, the, the rate of gain uh, for both of these types of heifers, the daily gain of, of the grazing heifers was about a pound a day um, versus the dry lot heifers were gaining about a pound and a half a day. And again, that's an average uh, over the entire period from weaning to breeding. So knowing that grazing heifers were lighter and um, they were adding weight at a lower rate on average, you know, that's that's one thing to consider. Um, but one of the most important aspects of this study was following those heifers through two breeding seasons to see if there were any differences in the percentage of heifers that reached puberty by the time they were AI'd and also pregnancy rates, not only to AI, but overall um, total season pregnancy rates. And again, through two two breeding and two, um, yeah, two breeding seasons. So this figure here shows those differences. And, and first off, you're looking at the percent pubertal by the time of AI. Grazing heifers were only about 46% of them were, were pubertal by that time, whereas nearly 90% of dry lot heifers had attained puberty um, by the time of AI. What's interesting, though, as we look at pregnancy rates, uh, we don't see any differences. You know, pregnancy to AI here in their first year were similar, um, you know, just 10% different. And then as we go to our overall pregnancy rates, just a 2% difference here between grazing and dry lot. And that that similarities, uh, they, they reached out to their second breeding season as well. And that was after all the heifers were managed together um, on range. After their first their first calving season, they were all managed on range um, until they were bred again. And so pregnancy rates did not differ. Um, so what we're seeing from this study is that while heifers developed to lighter weights may not reach puberty um, quite in the same time frame as heifers developed in a dry lot system, our pregnancy rates in a 60-day breeding season um, did not differ. And really the nuts and bolts of this study, um, they, they kind of boil down to that if pregnancy rates were equal among grazing and dry lot heifers, how did the cost of development compare as we think about profitability, right? So while grazing and dry lot heifers were of equal value um, initially when they were weaned, um, then they entered the development period, feed costs were actually lower in the heifers that were in the grazing system and that were able to utilize corn residue in native range, which going into the, the entire developmental cost, um, of course, that, that helped to reduce overall developmental cost in the heifers that were grazing. Um, so again, led to, led to that difference in about $40 here um, 
and, and showing that heifers can be developed to a lower percentage of mature body weight um, and, and doing that at a lower rate of gain, utilizing residue and dormant forage, if that's something that you have available in your environment. And you can do that without sacrificing reproductive efficiency. So in those environments where you have those feed options available, um, that can lead potentially lead to a lower um, cost of development. So now that we've talked about, um, you know, a, a target gain approach and thinking about developing heifers to maybe 65% or closer to 55% of mature weight um, and what might work in your environment, I think it's important to talk about some work that's been done on the pattern of gain during that, that entire development period. So if we, we think about the overall goal during heifer development is to take a weaned heifer calf and add weight to her before her first breeding season. And so if we just take a scenario here where a heifer maybe is weaned at 550 pounds and we want to add 300 pounds to her, um, 850 for to add some context here is about 60% of a 1400 pound mature weight. So that gives you some context on uh, the mature cow size and kind of picks an endpoint that is in the middle um, between the two systems, right? We're picking 60% um, kind of in the middle of the road. So it's pretty common that we'd want to attain this goal in about seven months time, right? So in this example, we're weaning heifers in October and we would be breeding them uh, maybe at the end of May, beginning of June, so that they could calve in February or March of the next year. And so if we just do some quick math, we're wanting to add 300 pounds in 210 days, which works out to 1.4 pounds per day on average. Of course, that is the key word here, right? So if that's on average, we have two options. We can develop those heifers to gain 1.4 pounds consistently each day for the entire seven months time. And that's shown here in the dashed, in the dashed line. Or we can use what's maybe referred to, uh, you might have heard um, referred to as the low high gain approach shown in the green line here. And so with that approach, uh, the majority of the time uh, a heifer is developed using a, a low rate of gain. And in the last 30 to 60 days of the developmental period, the rate of gain increases and the majority of weight is added uh, in that last time frame. And in that system, we're able to take advantage of, of some compensatory gain as well. So there's been decades of research um, on this topic. And just to summarize, when heifers are developed with either a constant rate of gain or a low high gain approach, um, there are no differences in pregnancy rates or in the time frame when they're calving during their first calving season. And following them for additional breeding season, um, there are no differences in pregnancy rates during that second year. So this is this is really good news when we think about it, right, for cattle producers, because it, it really gives us a lot of flexibility to provide an adequate amount of weight gain in a time frame. Um, but it allows us to do that using feeds that we're able to source uh, very cost efficiently or feeds that we have um, already in our operation. And Knowing your environment and knowing what resources you might have, um, you know, you can pick which system might work best for you. Uh, we can also tell from this that heifers can gain weight at a lower rate, uh, lower rate of gain for a period of time without affecting um, reproductive efficiency later on in life. So lastly, in this section, I just wanted to spend a minute or two mentioning implants because they do come up in conversation when we talk about backgrounding um, calves or if we talk about heifer development. So the general consensus is that if you absolutely know that a calf will be retained as a replacement heifer, it is best not to implant them knowing there are slight decreases to uh, reproductive performance. However, it doesn't necessarily always work that seamlessly in a, in a cattle operation, and sometimes we aren't able to make replacement decisions until much later, um, much later in the season. And so if you, if you want to take advantage of some extra gain by using an implant, um, you know, it's important to know how that can impact your replacement heifers. 
So overall, uh, do, do not use a, a growth promoting implant in heifers at less than one month of age um, because we know that it, it negatively impacts fertility and, and reproductive tract development. The results are uh, much less consistent as we look at heifers that are implanted later on, whether that be one to three months of age or from six to eight months of age. There are slight decreases to pregnancy rates um, when, when heifers are Im implanted at these time points. Um, and so that's just something to consider uh, that while the decrease might be slight, um, if it's something that you would like to, to avoid altogether, you know, don't implant your heifers. But considering the um, increased gain that implants can potentially provide, uh, you know, it's just something to weigh um, in your specific operation and thinking about which heifers that you'd like to retain. All right, so we've covered our bases on what criteria we should consider when we are selecting replacement heifers. And we've also talked about how heifers can be developed to a range of target weights based off of different systems um, without sacrificing reproductive efficiency, right? So now we just need to cover a few aspects of management after that heifer goes through her first breeding season, and especially as she approaches her first calving season. So when a heifer has been AI'd or um, pulled from, from a bull breeding system, we can't quite turn them on autopilot um, just yet, right? We need to make sure that we manage those heifers well so that they can have a successful calving season and rebreed um, the following year. So some research in South Dakota worked to evaluate just that and um, that post-breeding management period because we know how common it can be for heifers that are developed in a dry lot to then go through synchronization and be AI'd and then immediately turned out to um, summer pasture, right? And eventually um, turned in with bulls for the breeding season. And so this study um, took heifer calves and during a weaning period, uh, they spent about 40 days in a dry lot and they either stayed in the dry lot uh, for another 195 days or um, after the weaning period, they were um, placed on range um, to graze for that time period. At the end of the 195 days, uh, they were all artificially inseminated, and immediately after that, they were moved out to native range, um, whether they had spent time in a dry lot or whether they were already on range. So they were AI'd and immediately moved out to native range. And I do want to mention here that all heifers average 65% of mature body weight um, by the breeding season, and the percentage of heifers that were pubertal by that time point um, was not different, whether they were a grazing heifer or whether they were a dry lot heifer. So at the time of uh, pregnancy diagnosis, grazing heifers here in the green bar actually had a 59% pregnancy rate to AI, while dry lot heifers had a 49% pregnancy rate to AI even though all heifers were of a similar percent mature body weight and they all were um, a similar percent pubertal um, by the time of AI. And so this 10% increase that we see in pregnancy rates between the two groups really shows that um, prior grazing experience can be really helpful to avoid decreases in body weight and the decreases in conception rate to AI that we're seeing here. And so when you first turn out heifers, um, maybe from a dry lot to a pasture, you'll notice that they're, they're doing a lot of walking, right? They're trying to get used to a new environment. They're used to having feed brought to them and eating from a bunk. And now they have to learn uh, or relearn how to graze, right? And so combined, that's a, a pretty stressful situation that can lead to some decreases in um, body weight gain and, and body condition and, again, contributes to the decreases in conception rates that we're seeing here. So a few months later, um, as we think about a heifer going into her first calving season, it's important that we consider the energy reserves that she's carrying, right? She's going to need to utilize those not only to start lactating and raising her calf um, and go through uterine involution to hopefully cycle back in a timely manner, um, but she's also doing that all while growing, right? So her energy demands are are pretty serious. Um, she has she has a, a, lo a lot of energy demands during that time period. 
And so this research here shows that heifers that are in a more of a moderate or a moderately high body condition, being a five or six, actually conceive 75 to about 82 days after having their first calf. And that's really critical to think about because uh, in the beef industry, our our beef cows and beef heifers, they have just 85 days after calving um, to get rebred if they're going to calve on a yearly interval. And that's, um, you know, comparatively to a thinner heifer here that um, got pregnant 92 days after calving uh, for her first, first calving season. So secondly, heifers that are in a moderately high body condition score of six um, before their first calving season, they have pregnancy rates um, for the next year that are 15 to 20 percent greater than heifers here in a lower body condition of, of four to five. And so all that to say uh, is that it's recommended that heifers are managed to have a body condition score six going into their first calving season if they're going to um, cycle back and rebreed in a timely manner um, and maintain that pregnancy, right? And, and have a successful pregnancy going into the next year. So we've spent the last um, 35 minutes or so discussing really how complex heifer development is, um, but selecting heifers that are born and conceive in the first 21 days of the season, uh, developing them to an adequate body weight that fits your environment and utilizes um, economic and cost-effective feed resources that you have, and then managing them uh, with nutritional consistency after that first breeding season. Those are all key points to preparing heifers uh, to be successful cows uh, for your operation. And so with that, um, I know we're not live here, um, but I would welcome any questions by phone or email. Um, you're definitely welcome to reach out and uh, with any, any heifer development questions or any, any other questions you might have. Appreciate your time.